If you're somebody who has been struggling with finding your identity in the past sins that you've done, things that people have said about you, things that you struggle with, I have some good news for you today because that used to be me and this word specifically delivered me and now I'm able to walk into freedom and truly know my identity in Christ. So in order for us to know our identity in Christ, we have to know why we were even created. Why did God even create us? So if we can go back to Genesis 1, Basically, God created us to love us. God created us to enjoy him and to be enjoyed by him. It's super crazy to think that the king of the universe, the one who created the whole entire earth, had all this power, all this authority that he wanted to share it with somebody else because he is so humble. It doesn't make sense to our innate human minds why somebody would want to share power and love and all this whenever you could have it all on your own. But that's just how our God is. So in Genesis 1, God created the environment um, before he created us. So it's something super crazy is before the Lord like created the creation, he created the habitat for the creation, the environment for it. So for example, whenever God created the fish, he created the ocean first so that the fish could live in it. Whenever God created the trees, he created the earth and the ground so the trees could live in the ground. Before he created us, he turned to himself and said, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness and then created us. If you take a fish out of the water, it will die. If you take a tree out of the earth, it will die. If you take us out of the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, then we will be dead. That's why the word of God says you were once dead in your sin and dead in your trespasses, and now you're alive in Christ. So if you're feeling just emotionally numb, emotionally dead, and you're struggling, it's probably because you're not living in the environment that you were created to live in, which is the Holy Spirit. So continuing on, God finally created man in his own image, and then he also created um, Eve, which that's the story that we get of Adam and Eve. So we're going to be on Genesis 3 if you do have your Bibles. If you're just listening, um, then just listen along. I'm going to try not to mess up. (laughs) I always uh, tend to like stutter whenever I read the Bible, but hey, God can use anybody, right? So Genesis 3, 1, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it or you will die. So a little backstory, God created Adam and Eve and said you must rule the land. You can, you have dominion over all creation, which dominion just means power and authority. Like God is sharing his authority with us that we can say, hey, like, You lying over there, you ain't finna do that. Like, it's crazy that we're able to do that, him sharing his power. But he said, you can eat from all these things except for this, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is super crazy because you're like, okay, why would God even put that tree there for them to be tempted? It's actually by his grace that he put that there because would it even be love if we didn't get to choose to love somebody? So it was by God's grace that he gave us an option of, hey, you can either live for the enemy and live for the world or you can live for me because like I said it wouldn't be love if we were forced to love him so he said you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so knowledge of good and evil just means like knowing what is good and what is evil knowing what is sin and what isn't sin so She's going by the snake, getting tempted in that way, and she knows God's promises. She says, no, like God said we could eat from anything, just not this. So she knows what the Lord said. Continuing on, it says, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced she saw the truth beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it gave her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. I want you to step back and realize Satan's tactics have never changed. He's dumb. He's stupid. But then again, we still fall for it, which is so, so crazy. Eve would have never fallen into sin and fallen into temptation if she actually believed what God told her, if she actually believed the promises of God and trusted in him. Because as we can see, the first thing that Satan's going to do to come and tempt us is a did God really say statement. Did God really say that you can't talk bad about that person? Did God really say you couldn't watch that? Are you sure? Like, are you sure you couldn't just do it one time? Are you sure that God's not withholding? Because in here, what Eve felt like was God was withholding information from her. 
withholding something and she wanted control because when we don't understand everything that's going on in our life, we get upset and we want to take control. That's when we cave into sin is when we want to feel like we're in control of something. But if we would really understand that when we release control, that's when we're the most free. That's when we're the most joyous because we weren't made to control our lives. We were made to just have open hands and serve the Lord and him use us as instruments. That's why we're here on this earth. So if you go to the next thing, Satan says, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you'll become like God. If Eve actually believed what God said about her and Adam in Genesis 2, she already was like God. She was created in God's image. So Satan is always going to come. And the thing is, there's still some truth in this verse. Yes, her eyes were open, but a half truth is a full lie. So I think we need to realize that even whenever Satan came and tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he still used scripture and tried to twist it and try to tell him these things. So there's going to be people that come to you and be like, oh, well, like, hey, you could do this because the Bible doesn't specifically say this. No, we're to read what the Lord says, and to trust our convictions, to walk in in tune with the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about bearing fruits of the Spirit. It talks about living in life in tune with the Spirit. And when we walk in tune, we don't even have the desire to sin. Just because you don't have the desire doesn't mean temptations aren't going to come your way and you're, <laughs> you're going to want to um, possibly even do those things because we're flesh. But the thing is, even Jesus was tempted, but yet he did not sin. So temptation will still come your way, but it's who you're running to now. The thing is, when you're in the world, you didn't have someone to run to whenever you were tempted. But now that we have Jesus, we have someone to run to. When trials come our way, whenever circumstances happen that we don't like, that knock us down, we finally have someone to run to versus when we're in the world, we don't have anything to run to except for things of the world, which is like drugs, sex, money, partying, all of these things, which actually make a deeper and bigger hole. So continuing on, after Eve sinned, Eve and Adam both ate from the fruit. They felt shame. Whenever we sin, we tend to feel shame. We start to feel disgusted about ourselves. Like, you know, it's like, Jesus doesn't love me anymore, and I am my sin. She probably took on the identity of her sin and the things that she did. So what does she do? She tries to go around and cover herself with fig leaves. Many of us are living in, in sin, and we feel shameful, so therefore we want to cover these things with fig leaves. For example, I was super mean to everybody in high school, but that was just a fig leaf of the actual thing I was dealing with was self-hatred. So because I was dealing with self-hatred, I wanted to find all these fig leaves to cover myself up, to be mean. No one can know that I actually hate myself if I'm mean and if I do this and treat these people like this and say these things and go to parties and all these things. So my question to you today is, what are your fig leaves? What are your things that you're running from God? You're running from the truth and you are, are using all these other symptoms of sin to cover up how you actually feel, how you're actually seeing yourself. Continuing on, when the cold breeze, when the cold evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called the man, where are you? It's kind of crazy to me that God said, where are you? When he's a God of all knowing, but... Keep listening. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree, the tree, from the tree, sorry, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The thing is, God already knew that they had eaten from the tree, but whenever... God, you know, addresses somebody for their sin. He actually asked that question of, hey, what did you do? Because he's making a, a pathway for repentance. He's making an opening for them to be able to repent. And I want to even go, go back a little bit to the verse before where God is saying, where are you? To the one who feels like they need to, you know, get right with God and do all these things with Jesus and get closer to God. God is getting close to you. That's just the nature that of God is whenever people are sinning and whenever people are broken, he draws near to the brokenhearted. That is his word. So instead of you saying, oh, I just need to get right with God and get close with God, I think you need to open your eyes and realize that he's right in front of you and he has his arms open ready to hug you. The word says that God will never leave you nor forsake you and that nothing can separate you from the power of God's love. Nothing, not even hell, nothing can separate you from God's love. He is with you and he wants to hug you and he wants to walk this life with you, but you must have, to, you must realize it and you must open your eyes and be like, he actually is here, you know, instead of saying that, oh, well, we just need to do this and we just need to read our word more and pray more and all these things. Those things come. The thing is that we should start doing things from love and from victory rather than for it. 
And this is something God has convicted me about um, just in the past of me wanting to perform for God because of just how I was raised in, in my childhood. I felt like I had to perform in order to receive love. So it's like if I'm struggling mentally and I feel like I'm not close with God and everything, which that just comes from unbelief in his word because he says he's close to us. He's close to the brokenhearted, right? God, I don't feel you. I'm not close to you. So let me read my word more. Let me read my word. I'm going to wake up at 4 a.m. every morning. I'm going to intercede and I'm going to do this and I'm going to worship. And the thing is, all these things are good, but what's the heart posture behind it? You are doing this in order and in hopes to, to receive a love that he's already giving you without doing those things. So if we reshape our heart and be like, okay, I'm actually going to wake up in the morning and pray because he loves me, because he loves me, not for him to love me. I'm actually going to wake up and read my Bible because he has saved me, not because I'm wanting him to save me now. So what it is, is just us coming into agreement with the word of God. He is for you. He loves you. He sees you, friend. So if we keep continuing on the scripture, it says, when God asked him, who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the fruit who I command you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me, uh, who, who, who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more all more than all the animals, domestic and wild, you'll crawl on your belly. And he continues and talks about the curse that not only the serpent will receive, but humans will receive. That's why women have pregnancy pains. That's why men have to work. That's why there is the ground that you have to labor on the ground and, and the thorns and thistles and all these things. But I want you to hold on to something. After Adam repented and said, God, yes, Eve gave me this. First off, I want to address that. God addressed Adam before he addressed Eve because the man should be the head of the woman which is something super crazy. Continuing on, he says, okay, well, like, let me go ask Eve. Ask Eve, who who gave you this? Like, what happened? Did you eat from this? And she says, yes, but the serpent gave it to me. Whenever Adam and Eve confess that this is the sin that they caved into, God was not mad at them. He was mad at the serpent. And he says, because you have done this serpent, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild, you'll crawl on your belly. So when we come to the Lord and we confess what we did and we repent, we no longer are blamed for it. It is Satan who is blamed. God wants an honest heart coming to him open and saying, God, this is me. Forgive me. So continuing on. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be a mother to all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden and he spent and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard to guard the way of the tree of life. I want you to understand the foreshadowing that the Bible holds. So whenever Adam and Eve felt shame, they tried to get these fig leaves to cover themselves up so that God wouldn't see their shame and stuff. But when they came to God and confessed their sin and repented, he didn't blame them. He blamed Satan. And not only did he do that, but he... He sacrificed an animal, stripped it of its skin, a pure, a pure-blooded animal, a perfect animal, so that they could wear the, the the skin of it to cover up their shame. So what this was doing is it was foreshadowing what Jesus was actually going to do for us. When we come to God and we are are in sin and we confess these things, He no longer sees your shame or your nakedness. He sees the thing that He covers you with, which is perfect and pure blood. So He was showing that whenever they covered the animal skin, that is what Jesus is going to do for us after He died on the cross. And you say, okay, Karu, but after Adam and Eve, you know, they died, they still had to sacrifice animals and they still had to do all of these things. Yes, because, you know, God set this scene up. But the reason we had the law, the reason that we have the raw, the law and the commandments and all these things is for God to prove that we are sinful, to prove that we need a savior. And it's so crazy to me because we feel like, oh, well, if we could do these things, then, you know, we could be perfect. If we could follow all these rules, then, hey, maybe maybe God will be more pleased with us. But the word of God says that you were saved through grace and, and by faith in Jesus. You were saved by his grace, not because of the works that you have done. There's nothing that you could do to earn the Father's love. And if you are trying to do that, then that's what one would consider being self-righteous. Self-righteousness means that you think you are righteous all by yourself. That's when we hear the word legalistic and see churches being overly this, 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 instead of looking at the heart and allowing God to work from the inside out 
then they become very prideful and they, they think because they're following, you know, these rules. And I mean, I like to use the example of if you've ever been to a church that, you know, you don't feel comfortable and like everyone's judging you because they're wearing, you know, specific clothing, looking super nice, acting like very performative and fake and, you know, feel holier than thou type B. And the thing is, it's great to have reverence towards the Lord. It's great to dress nice for the Lord, but it's what's the heart posture because the word of God says that Jesus looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outside things that we, we do. Those things are overflow from our heart, but I think a lot of people have it backwards and they want to be like Pharisees and they want to you know, live a life that looks good on the outside, but not one that their heart is actually matching. So I think it's a heart check in realizing what is my posture behind doing these things. And I think we can see that often in social media, a lot of people are posting, you know, not for God to have the platform, but they, so that they can have the platform on their own. We see a lot of people, um, not even just with with God, but just with anything, posting all these things. And they're saying, oh yeah, like this is my niche. It's, it's about, you know, animals or it's about um, sports or whatever, but it's not about elevating the thing you're talking about. It's about elevating oneself. And the thing is, we were not made to <laughs> have a platform like what we do today. I'm telling you, we are created to be reflectors of glory, not receivers of glory. Because whenever we try to wear a crown that only God can, it will crush us. That's why the the word says we must cast our crowns unto the Lord. The Lord will entrust us with platforms and followings, and he will trust us with with big things, but we are not made to bear it. We're not made to hold it. We're made to cast it onto him because he is the only one who can bear the glory because he's so good. I also want you to realize that in Genesis, by God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden, that was actually by his grace because I think a lot of people, at least whenever I read this as a kid, I'm like, okay, well, they sinned, so he's mad at them. He said, get out of the garden. No, because if they would have continued to eat from the tree of life, then they would have lived in their sin forever. But God said, no, we're gonna kick you out and I have an angel guarding this so that you can never go back to it so you can have a second chance at living in purity with me crazy. So whenever Jesus comes down and lives a perfect life that literally none of us could ever live, he shows us that we can never do it on our own and that how much we need him. So when he's sacrificed, his blood is spilt, he bleeds out, he dies the most gruesome, the most embarrassing, the most brutal death, which I would love to talk about in another podcast in depth and in detail of the cross and what actually happened in that because I don't think we actually understand because if we did understand, we would be acting differently. And that's probably why you've clicked on this podcast. It's like, well, I mean, I believe in God and all these things, but why do I still feel like my identity is in this? The thing is, Satan believes in God too, but he's just not willing to be obedient to his word. So we can believe in the cross and believe in Jesus, but if we're still taking identity of the past, we're no better than Satan, we're no better than demons. We must look past our past and look at at what Jesus has already done for us and walk into freedom because Satan is so miserable that he wants you to keep looking back at the things you did so you can live a life just like him and be miserable. But he does not want you to live alive in Christ because the thing is Satan doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about you. He only cares about God and hurting God his biggest enemy. So if we're made in the image of God, whenever he comes for us and tempts us and makes us do all these things, it's actually hurting the heart of God. It hurts God's heart to see his kids suffer. So don't let Satan win. Don't let Satan have the foothold over your father. That makes me mad even thinking about it. So in Ephesians 2, you say, Karu, who even are we now? So we go to Ephesians 2 and it says, once you were dead because of your disobedience of your many sins, get it dead because you didn't live in the environment of the Holy Spirit. Get it and walk in tune. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, nothing that you have done. It's that it's only by his grace 
that you even know him. So cast off all this feeling like you need to do all these things to earn God's love. You already have it. You just have to receive it. And in order for you to receive it, you have to enter in at a humble heart and be like, God, I can never do anything to deserve this love. So I'm just going to sit and receive and quit trying to prove my existence and prove myself to you. He's not like man. He only looks at the heart for him. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. We are now royalty because we know the king. So therefore we are princes and princesses. He says he has seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. How many of us do not believe that today? We're not walking like we're royalty. We're walking like we're peasants and we're disgusting and we're we're all these things. But God, it says he seated us in heavenly places so God can point to us all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. As shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things we have done. Somebody need to hear this. I'm going to read it again. It, this is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he has planned for us long ago. It is a gift. And what is a gift? It is something that is freely given, that you don't have to do anything for. It. Whenever you know your parents give you gifts on Christmas, you didn't have to go and work for it. I hope you didn't. I'm sure someone has a story where they might have had to do that, and I'm sorry for that, but usually when you receive a gift, it's just to celebrate you. It's just because they love you. So salvation is a gift from God by his grace and by you believing in him, saying, God, I believe this is what you did. I'm going to have faith. Help me have faith, and I'm going to walk in freedom with you. Then you have salvation. You just have to call upon the name of the Lord and allow the Lord to guide you. There's two people, um, I think, that qualifies lukewarm and one would be the person who abuses God's grace so the one who says "Mm, I'm going to keep on sinning regardless God will forgive me I'll do whatever I want and the one who doesn't understand God's grace which is like well I need to perform and I need to do all these things you know for God to love me even more and both of those I believe are lukewarm because God's grace is a gift that's freely given so it says in Ephesians 2 at the beginning it says that once you were dead because of your disobedience of your many sins. So when you're walking in disobedience, you are dead, like truly. There's times that we're going to, you know, sin and fall into sin, but not live in sin. It says to live life in tune with the spirit, not to live in sin. So once you were living in sin and now you're alive in Christ, there's times that you're going to mess up. There's times that you're going to sin. But the thing is, Jesus Christ already saw those things and he's already forgiven you for those things, but he looks at your heart. So if you're trying to deceive the Lord God Almighty and be like, eh, I'm going to go into this, I'm going to ask for forgiveness later. Do you know that repentance is turning away? Repentance isn't just confessing with your mouth, but it's turning from something, from, from sin. So not only do we confess to God, but we turn from it. We allow him to change our mind. And if you're struggling with um, just a specific sin, um, I know there's lots of sexual sin just going around in the body of Christ because that's something done in secret. I want you to understand this. If you would go to God and be so honest with him how you feel and have an open heart, open heart at wanting to change and willing to work towards it, because the thing is, we, we have to understand that we have to pursue healing. It says, if anyone wants to be my disciples, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. All of those things take doing something. And the thing is, we don't do these things in order to deserve freedom, but we do these things because we already have freedom and he's showing us how to walk in it. So don't abuse the Lord's grace, but also understand that he is gracious. I know that's something really hard for our human minds to grasp. But for me, it takes me just sitting every single morning with God and be like, God, who am I? Who do you say that I am? Lord, help me believe these truths. And the thing is, anything, say, the name Satan, by the way, means accuser. We can see that in the book of Job before he tempts Job. Before Satan can tempt anyone, he has to go in, to the heavenly courts and ask God if you can be tempted. So just understand that the word of God said that no temptation has overtaken you because you have Christ Jesus now. So whenever you're in the world, you no longer have the power to turn from sin. But because you have Jesus Christ living in you, you do because it shows that Jesus lived a perfect life. Even when temptation came his way, he did not sin. So there's always a way out, the word of God says. And what do you say? Okay, what's the way, Karu? The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
that no one comes to the Father except through him. So anytime you're struggling with temptation of sexual sin and desire to do, you know, things that you shouldn't, parting, whatever that looks like, you have to turn to the only way out. It says there's a way, not multiple ways, and he is the way. So it's not saying that temptation is not going to come, but it says when it comes, we know who to look to. We turn to Jesus. So if that means when you're feeling tempted, you need to get out of your room and go read your word and you need to go get in your car and start worshiping, or you need to go hit a friend up to start praying over you and seeking out Jesus, then glory to God. But we have to be willing to turn to the Lord, deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. So the name Satan means accuser. And what I've been learning is that anytime I start to feel these accusations over my life and over my identity, um, that doesn't align with what the word of God says. It's always Satan whispering them. So if you've ever heard you're a burden, you're worthless, nobody cares for you. You're the things that you did in the past. You are, you know, what those people have said about you. I rebuke it in Jesus name because Satan, his name, like I said, means accuser. So he's going to keep telling you things and accusing you of things that are not the truth. Jesus always has a rebuttal for the accusations that Satan says over your life. So he says, you're a burden. Actually, no, Matthew, I think eleven twenty eight. Don't quote me on that scripture says, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So therefore, if we go to Jesus and the word of God says, I am in Christ and he is in me. When we take his burden, then it's a light. So you are not a burden and you feel like, oh, I am worthless. No, because Jesus, God sent his son down on this earth, the God of the universe, his son, his most prized possession is his deepest love to die for you. You are, if that doesn't prove your worth, you are worth more than billions and billions of dollars. I'm telling you, like we cannot even understand it. So all these things that Satan is telling you, rebuke it and say, I'm not, I'm going to put, if you're watching on YouTube, a little screenshot of all the truths that God says that we are so that when you are feeling these things that you can say, no, these, this is what I am. And this is what the word of God says in Ephesians. It talks about us, you know, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against dark and evil principalities of the unseen world. So that shows as well. I think it talked about in Genesis. We just read that Satan is actually, I think it was in Ephesians that Satan is, you know, the ruler of all the things in the unseen world, like in the darkness and all that stuff. So we're fighting against demonic and we're fighting against demons and all these things. So it's so important that we're putting on the armor of Christ and the only offensive weapon, which means the thing to fight back in the armor of Christ is the sword of the spirit which is the Holy Spirit and the word of God. You cannot fight back with, you know, your own words if you're not using the name of Jesus. You cannot fight back if you're not using scripture. And that might be why you keep falling into sin because you don't have the right tools to fight with. So friend, I just pray that this episode has helped you just open your eyes to walk into freedom into who you truly are and realize when you believe these things, you no longer have to prove yourself. You don't have to prove your existence. You don't have to prove why you are the way that you are because God created you for a reason, for a purpose, and he loves you so very much. So Lord, I just want to thank you for my friend who is listening now. I pray that you would bless them in Jesus' name. I pray that they would feel your Holy Spirit now in Jesus' name. And if there's been any demonic trying to you know, take over their identity, Lord, we rebuke it in Jesus' name over their mental health, over their sexuality, Lord. Lord, over addictions, Lord, over past sin struggles, over things spoken over them, we rebuke it and send it back to the pits of hell in Jesus' name. And I speak life over them. They are chosen, not forsaken. Lord, they are loved. They were bought with a high price and they are forgiven if they have confessed with their mouth that you were Lord and believed, Lord, in Jesus' name. I thank you so much, Jesus. Amen.